Good evening. My name is Jim Ron, and it is my privilege and honor to serve as the president of the Great Hearts Texas Board of Directors. Uh, I'd like to confirm that we have a quorum of board members before we uh, formally begin. So I'll call the roll. Uh, Jackie Muchigamba, Brandon Byrne. Here. Shannon Sedgwick Davis. Yes. Alicia Christie. Here. Jonathan Sanford. I am here. Kevin Hall. Kevin is not here. I know he's planning to join us, but we'll mark him not present for now. And Jim Ron here. We have a quorum of the board, and therefore I'm going to call the um, September 5th, 2024 meeting of the Great Arts Texas Board to order at 6.03 p.m. The first item on our agenda is the public comment, and I'm going to turn this over to our Chief of Staff, Megan Freeman, who will manage the public comment, both virtual and in person. And I also want to note for the record that we did receive written comments uh, from parents and others in the great arts community. Those all, were all distributed to the board and, and those were read in advance of the meeting uh, as well. So with that, Megan, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. Tonight, each person who has signed up for public comment will receive two minutes. Uh, we have a two minute timer from Ms. Hefty over here. Our first comment is from James Wilcox. Is James here? Okay. Our next comment is from Tracy Gardner. Is Tracy here? Our next comment is from Mr. Matson. You stand right here. Okay. He's got two minutes per topic, so uh, agenda items. Right. Okay. Uh, thanks for having me. Thank you all for all the service you do. I wasn't sure if I should uh, give my Kamala Harris voice. I, I don't know which accent I should give. I'm not sure, uh, but I'm going to try to wing this. Um, Great Hearts is the best classical charter school in the nation, bar none. I don't even think it's close. There's a lot of competition, but what we do and what we have done uh, is unparalleled. But it won't continue to be that way if we don't take ourselves seriously. That doesn't mean that we can't joke or laugh, but it means that on the substantive things, we absolutely have to get things right. And that starts with the board, because the board sets the tone. The board uh, provides an example of leadership. And so a number of parents have been pointing this out for years, and we've made some significant progress, but we're not there yet. And the big problem is we have board members who do not identify uh, with the Great Hearts mission. Um, for example, um, <laughs> I guess my toxic trait is that I expect that when I make an argument and it's backed with facts, that people will respond rationally. And so in this case, that hasn't happened because um, to understand what Great Hearts is means you have to have an understanding that social justice and DEI are incompatible with our mission. Yet we have board members who outwardly identify themselves as advocates of social justice and DEI. And so when our teachers, when our headmasters, when our executive directors, when our competitors see that, they know that we're not serious about what we do. It sends a mixed message. Um, and so we absolutely should not have that. Um, I'm sure they're wonderful people, but Ms. Christie, for example, uh, her LinkedIn page promotes herself as a DEI advocate. That is 100% inconsistent with uh, great hearts. So I thought, well, maybe there's another reason why Ms. Christie is on the board. And I did a public information request. I thought maybe maybe she's bought the seat. Okay. And so then I get two minutes on. Uh... Okay. And so is this my general topic time or is this my... 
The PIA request indicated that she's given a whopping hundred dollars since I believe 2018. Uh, and so I, I have to ask why, if we believe in what we do, why do we have board members who don't live the mission, who don't talk the talk, who don't walk the walk, but in, instead act contrary to it? I'm sorry. And so. Chairman Ron, I just wanted to let you know that um, Kevin Hall has joined the meeting. Thank you. Yeah, so I guess I'll come back up here and I'll use a different accent and uh, then we'll get the point across maybe differently. Uh, thank you for your time today. You. I appreciate you coming. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay, our next person, our next topic, uh, our next person who signed up would be Amanda Coleman on Zoom. Ms. Coleman, are you here today? I am, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Thank you. Good evening. I'm a mother of three and a founding family at Great Hearts Lakeside and have spoken in the past about the importance of hiring people whose personal values align with Great Hearts classical conservative organizational values. Common sense, as well as plenty of professionals and scientific studies, affirm the importance of this practice. I'm grateful for the recent decision to hire an interim superintendent who's proven himself to align with Great Hearts values, as well as the new mission aligned board members. Thank you for listening to our concerns and acting upon them. I would like to request our board review its members to see if their personal values align with Great Hearts, and if not, make a decision to replace them with new members who are mission aligned, or better yet, those who know they aren't, resign. There are a couple on the board who we have reasonable cause to believe their personal values do not align with Great Heart's traditional values. One has demonstrated on social media that she values progressive ideas such as BLM and social justice. There's a second board member who prominently displays diversity, equity, and inclusion advocate in her LinkedIn bio. And we've shared many times how DEI and BLM ideology are antithetical to Great Heart's classical meritocratic values. And I think it's reasonable to request a conversation be opened up as a board to make sure that those who are leading our organization are fully committed to our classical values and pedagogy. It's important that parents have full confidence that our leadership from the top down are protecting our schools from the insidious pop culture ideas such as social emotional learning and diversity, equity, and inclusion. Perhaps these ideas started out pure as they claim, but those of us who have spent time understanding the dark underbelly know that they have since been hijacked by the Marxist movement, which is antithetical to our movement. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Ms. Coleman. Next, we have Mary Ramadi. Mary, are you here or online, in person or online? Okay, we'll move to the next person. We'll come back to these. Greg Couch, are you here? Thank you, you've got two minutes. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for your time. Thank you for uh, coming. Uh, not an issue of uh, as great import as some of those other ones that were brought up, but uh, recently, or I'm sorry, last year, I inquired of Great Hearts Western Hills uh, what their plans are for expansion or the possibility to purchase land around the area. Uh, we we're told to bring the issue before the board, uh, and so I'd like to uh, to somehow get on the board's radar about the possibility to buy land around Great Hearts Western Hills uh, before we become landlocked, because uh, it is a school that feels at least bursting at the seams and we still don't have all of our, our grades built out yet. And so the land is not cheap, but it's only getting more expensive. And I don't want to miss that opportunity to grow where we can and continue the tradition of excellence that we have and uh, not basically hem ourselves in for, for uh, lack of a better reason. So thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, we have Lindsay Mayer. Is Lindsay here? Yes, I'm here. Okay, you have two minutes. Thank you. All right. Um, I'm a mom of four at Forest Heights, and I primarily want to note the increasing number of class sections in our lower school. We added a kinder section the past two years, making five kindergarten and five first grade sections this year. 
That's about 160 kids per grade, which have to have space and time accommodations in the NPR for lunch and on the playground. The NPR must facilitate six grades in total for lunch and a rotating schedule for indoor PE classes. It also means that our K through two specials teachers are now responsible for 14 sections of scholars. I can't imagine training 14 sections of five to eight year olds to sing, nor grading Latin quizzes for 450 young scholars. Our campus is wonderful and our teachers are attentive, but that's a very heavy load of seven separate sections each day. I ask, as I have before, that we slow the growth rate of our existing campuses. This would also alleviate some of the car line burden and the effect we have on our surrounding community. Um, and finally, I want to ask that each of you always seek truth, goodness, and beauty and do all you can to nurture that in our schools and leadership. We believe that truth is knowable and not malleable, nor does it shift with cultural winds of change. We entrust the education of our children to you and hope that you hold fast to that mission, even in the face of any opposition. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much for your time. Okay, let's circle back to those that weren't here. James Wilcox, have you joined us? Tracy Gardner? Mary Ramadi. I'm. I, can you hear me? Yeah. This is, Tracy. Yes, this is Tracy. Sorry, I'm. I'm still in the car, so I will. <laughs> I will try to do these comments from my car. I. I really apologize. I got. I got held up in traffic. Um. So my. My name is Tracy Gardner. I'm a parent from Great Hearts Northern Oaks, and I have uh, five children there. And this school has been a complete blessing to our family. My older children, in particular are just benefiting tremendously from this education. And I have a, a senior there this year. My oldest is at Hillsdale and my senior um, tells me every day how lucky she is to be a Great Hearts Northern Oak student um, and that she's gonna miss this school tremendously when she graduates and what a blessing that it has been to her uh, during her time here at this school. Um, so I'm, I'm very, very thankful for the time. This is our eighth year at this school, and we're very thankful for the time. But like many of the other parents who have already spoken, I, I am concerned about the future of, of Great Hearts if we don't uh, continue to explore some of the folks who are on the board and some of the folks who are also in our HR department and in other um, administrative offices who are responsible for hiring um, and training up our teachers. Our teachers are the heart and soul of this school. We love and adore these teachers and we need to support them and give them what they need and support the original vision upon which this school was founded. And I do fear that this diversity, equity and inclusion and these unaligned values that have been brought into our school with the, with the previous superintendent and with the people that he hired um, will not go away until we eliminate those individuals that were brought into this uh, into this school from that previous superintendent are completely eliminated. So I urge your time the is rest up. Thank you, Miss Gardner. Thank you. Okay, let's see. We've got Mary Ramadi. Is Mary here? Okay, I think we're ready to move on. Thank you. Hey, thanks to all who uh, chose to speak or to provide written comments. We appreciate that. Um, the board had the opportunity today, at least several of us, to spend time at Invictus. And I want to thank the headmasters and assistant headmasters for welcoming, uh, welcoming us and for the scholars for uh, showing us uh, what it means to be uh, members of the great arts community. So we learned a lot. It was an inspiring day and a reminder of why we're here and what we're trying to accomplish. With that, I want to turn it over to Interim Superintendent Dyke, who will introduce our headmasters who are going to welcome us to their campus. This one working, thank you. Well, we're, just to follow on the chairman's comments, we're so grateful for everyone involved in the Great Hearts community, uh, especially our headmasters. 
because they they bear such the brunt of the burden of running schools, but patience of parents, patience of students, enthusiasm of students, all comes back to the headmaster every day, along with other things. So with that, I do want to introduce the two headmasters here, running Invictus Lower School and Upper School. Uh, Mrs. Leah Hammonds has been at Great Hearts for 10 years. Please come on up, because I'll let you, uh, I'll hand you the mic here in a second. She started at Great Hearts Monta Vista, where she taught fifth grade uh, and worked as assistant headmaster there before coming here to be headmaster of the lower school. Mrs. Hammonds, I'll, I'll alter interest, Mrs. Tara Monte, Monteverde. Um, Mrs. Monteverde joined Great Hearts in May of 2021. Uh, she's she's was a was a parent looking for a home, <laughs> and turned into a teaching role and now a headmaster role here as founding headmaster of the upper school. We're very grateful for both of you and welcome your comments. I want to thank everyone for joining us this evening. A big thank you to our families. Um, we have a very active community here. Um, when I first came and viewed this campus, I was just impressed with the incredible opportunity this was to bring classical liberal arts education to the northwest side of San Antonio and Holotus. Um, it's been an incredible opportunity for me to work on this amazing project and help building this campus for this community. It has also been an incredible opportunity for our founding families. Um, one of my fondest memories is our first PSO meeting with this families, and one of the first things they requested was athletics program, and we have been able to deliver that. Um, and now we have Ms. Monteverdi that has joined our campus, and it has been such an incredible summer planning with her and all the conversations that we've had about the future of Invictus, and um, I'm just so um, incredibly encouraged um, with all the people that have poured so much of their time and energy into our campus. I wanna thank the board and Dr. Dyke again for letting us show off a little bit our amazing campus here. Um, and I know Mrs. Hammonds alluded to where we started and I'd like to talk a little bit about where we're headed. So we, like other Great Hearts campuses, we are in a period of growth with our high school wing. We are breaking ground on that next year we will then move into that high school wing the following year. So where some would see this immense task of expansion and sort of be daunted at the idea of it, uh, we welcome the opportunity and the challenge that comes with that. So as we enroll new students, it is our teachers who are truly at the heart of this challenge. Each and every day, they take center stage at the great discussions that happen in our classrooms. Our curriculum focuses on our core values like diligence, honesty, and perseverance. And our staff works hard to help them internalize those values and then live them out. As we grow, that will not change. That is what makes us who we are, that defines us as the Great Hearts Campus. And so we look forward to the opportunity to continue to serve you. Thank you both. As we turn to the rest of the agenda, I would I would like to encourage my fellow board members to announce your name uh, before speaking uh, so that we're all aware of who's uh, making the comments. It's especially relevant for those of you participating virtually. We'll turn our attention now to the consent agenda. Uh, is there a board member or board members who would like to remove one or more of the items from the consent agenda? If so, please speak up. There be, being none, I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. This is Jonathan Sanford. I uh, move to approve the consent agenda. This is Kevin Hall, I second. The motion has been made and seconded to approve the consent agenda. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion to approve the consent agenda is unanimous, unanimously approved at 621 p.m. The Great Arts community will recall that at the request of the board, the TEA appointed a conservator uh, to oversee HR uh, onboarding compliance matters. 
Uh, the conservator, Mr. Paul Pastrick, is with us this evening. For those of you who were at our June board meeting or tuned in virtually, uh, you met Mr. Pastrick at that time. And it is his opportunity right now to provide an update to the Great Hearts uh, Board and community on his work. Uh, Mr. Pastrick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I uh, want to give a brief report. Uh, I want to remind everyone that I was appointed uh, on May 29th of this year. Uh, to address the issues that the chairman outlined. Uh, I want to let the board and the community know that uh, I have been able to review records and meet with staff members of uh, Great Hearts. And uh, I have determined that there have been a number of corrective actions that have been taken by Great Hearts and the HR department, uh, which are very positive and uh, moving in the right direction. Uh, however, I think that there is more work that needs to be done. Uh, and I've had uh, discussions with uh, the uh, CEO and the vice president for HR uh, about these. Uh, we will uh, work collaboratively to develop a uh, master uh, set of recommendations uh, that will assure corrective actions be made. Um, and we will uh, do that by no later than uh, the middle of October. Um, and uh, but I do want to assure the board and uh, assure the community that I'm very pleased with the initial uh, corrective actions that have been undertaken by Great Hearts Texas. And I think uh, we're definitely moving in a very positive direction. I'm available to answer any questions that you may have or otherwise. Members of the board, any questions for Mr. Pastrick? Uh, this, we're not having open questions, Morgan, just, just questions from the board. Thank you, Mr. Pastrick. We, we uh, thank you for your report and look forward to our continued uh, work with you. Um, at this time, the board is going to move into executive session. For those of you who are attending in person or online, it is our hope and plan to move through executive session uh, as expeditiously as we can. So I'm hoping that shortly after 7.30, we'll be back uh, to take any actions from executive session and also to continue then with the interim superintendent report, the finance report and the like. Uh, so I'd like to entertain a motion to move to closed session pursuant to the government code sections noted on our agenda, namely sections 551.071, 551.072, 551.074, and any others. And want to remind all that no actions, votes, or decisions are made in closed se session. Um, I'd entertain a motion. Second. Second. It's been moved and seconded to move into executive session. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion is approved unanimously at 626 p.m. to move to executive session.
Okay, uh, the Great Hearts Texas Board is going to come back into open session 8.14 p.m. Uh, and I'm going to open the floor to board members who uh, may wish to take action coming out of executive session. Uh, Chairman Ron, um, this is, uh, Vice Chair Mitchigamba, I'd like to make a motion to create a governance committee on the uh, board that includes yourself, Jim Ron, Shannon Cedric Davis, and JJ Sanford, and nominating JJ Sanford as chair of that committee. Is there a second? Brendan Byrne, I second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to form a governance committee of the board of directors. Uh, J.J. Sanford, Chair, uh, Shannon Sedgwick, Davis, and Jim Ron, the other members of that committee. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously, 8.15 p.m. Any other business that the board would like to conduct coming out of executive session? Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is uh, Board Member Kevin Hall. I uh, would like to um, propose that uh, the board take no action on uh, the expulsion uh, hearing that we discussed in executive session. Is there a second? I second. And that's... Uh, Shannon Sedgwick Davis. Thank you, Shannon. Uh, it's been moved and seconded to take no action on the expulsion appeal that was discussed in executive session. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously, 8.16 p.m. Any other business the board wishes to conduct? Yes, this Jonathan Sanford. I'd like to make a motion that we appoint Dr. Wade Dyke as the sole finalist as permanent superintendent of Great Hearts, Texas. Is there a second? Second, Director Christie. It's been moved and seconded to name Dr. Wade Dyke as the sole finalist as superintendent of Great Hearts, Texas. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously, 8.17 p.m. It's with great pleasure that the Board of Directors has announced Dr. Wade Dyke as the lone finalist for the role of superintendent of Great Arts Texas. The Great Arts Texas community has sought long-term, strong, and focused leadership and we are confident that we have found our permanent leader in Dr. Dyke. Dr. Dyke is not only known and respected as a figure within our community, but also a, is a nationally recognized leader in the field of education. His deep understanding of our classical education mission and his commitment to excellence assures that Great Arts Texas is well positioned for continued success. We believe this decision reflects the stability and continuity that our community deserves. Dr. Dyke's proven leadership and vision make him the ideal candidate to lead Great Hearts Texas into the future. The board will take further action to officially hire Dr. Dyke at a meeting following the mandatory 21-day waiting period. Uh, and so, Dr. Dyke, congratulations on being named uh, sole finalist. And we're going to move to the next item on our agenda, which is the interim superintendent report. So uh, we're going to turn it over to you. How about that? Is that okay? This is the first and less lesson of the uh, superintendent in waiting. <laughs> um, th th thank you to the board for your confidence in me. Uh, I think it's it's mainly a confidence in this organization and the strength of uh, the Great Hearts organization nationwide. Uh, but I'm I'm certainly honored to to serve as your superintendent. And we'll see what the next few weeks bring. Uh, with that, I do want to introduce uh, Lisa Zerbonia. Uh, Lisa, Lisa has really championed the startup of the schools this year. Uh, she and her team 
And, and I just thought the board should be aware of some of the work that's gone on, some of the successes. Uh, I think the, the general support of the parents is probably the, the, the most important indicator of how well this has gone uh, for Great Hearts Texas in this cycle. And I think a lot of that credit belongs to uh, Lisa and her team. So I wanted Lisa to have the chance to give you the highlights of the opening uh, this, this August. Just handed this. So thank you, Dr. Dyke. And I have to say, congratulations. So um, very happy. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about operations. Uh, it's one of the things that maybe is in the, the, the background as it should be. But I just have three different areas today that I wanna talk to you about that the campuses have been working extremely hard over the summer to support um, what is happening uh, as these students come into campus. So very brief, really here. So first thing, safety. Um, the safety coordinators uh, throughout the campuses uh, met for a three-day boot camp. And in that three-day boot camp, they went over as far as new security requirements from the state. Uh, we integrated new PA systems, cameras, uh, and I'm going to say lots of cameras, uh, and more than probably close to $200,000 worth of improvements, thank you, uh, going into some of those uh, safety security initiatives that we were doing there. As far as um, the state is implementing a new platform for all districts to record their safety intruder audits, um, threat assessments, et cetera, that is gonna be launched next fall. It's a very quick launch. Uh, we met with the TEA last Thursday uh, of what that looks like. They were looking um, to schools to take initiative pretty quickly with that. Our district, we are already rolling in that. So uh, Brian Cornish has already taken that to the campuses uh, and our safety coordinators already have access uh, before it's being rolled out. He's gonna be discussing that with the headmasters next week. Uh, so I'm really proud that we are ahead of even the state with the initiatives there. Uh, and for my boss, yes, it is free from the state. So um, from uh, next thing I talk about just quickly as far as enrollment, uh, exciting changes as far as growth into uh, our facilities and um, the campuses. So congratulations to the Upper Live Oak campus that uh, did a ribbon cutting a couple weeks ago. So uh, part of that growth too in North Texas, we are breaking ground uh, with the campus, uh, upper campus in Arlington. Uh, so lots of exciting things to come. With that growth, we're at about 13,000 students across the state. And I put a little fun fact in here as far as what our student population looks like, because it's really changed a lot, I think, in the last couple of years. Uh, in the North Texas area, it's about 42%, and in San Antonio, uh, we're at 58%. So that kind of gives you uh, an idea of where our student population, as far as our districts, so we were already saying in the San Antonio area or in the North Texas district. Uh, so that's where our uh, growth um, is, and we're continuing to do that. One of the things I wanted to highlight, which uh, a lot of times never is highlighted, I guess, uh, and talked about, is our nutrition program. So two years ago, we had um, where you would heat the meals up and put them in, uh, and it wasn't very popular uh, as far as um, the feedback. Uh, we retrofitted the kitchens, and now we make the food uh, at the campuses. Along with that, um, we are partnering with uh, Texas Agricultural Department um, and the uh, USDA uh, for food, um, fresh food from the farmers, from local farmers. Uh, and so there's, we're supporting our local communities. And because we're doing that, um, uh, the 
grant that we got uh, back is close to $200,000 and another $385,000 um, from the Ag Department. We're putting that back into the nutrition uh, program. So hopefully you'll see that your the scholars will they'll appreciate uh, that pizza on Friday. I know that's a popular thing. Uh, with that growth in addition, we're also looking at ways that we can get the kiddos through the lines faster so they can spend more time, maybe socializing a little bit uh, during their, their lunchtime. So I uh, wanted to make sure we highlighted that. Those are some of the things that we're doing over the summer and lots of other things happening, but wanted to kind of give you an update on that. Good. Uh, any questions from the board for Lisa? Okay, thank you. Thanks. Lisa, thank you very much. I appreciate all your hard work and, and a reflection of how much work you and your team have done. So thank you. Uh, let, I thought the board should also hear from uh, our academic side so that so that you could see where we ended last year in terms of the star testing that the state of Texas performs. Uh, Dr. Will Rutherford uh, announced last month that he was leaving to take a new opportunity. Uh, and so in the interim, uh, Jake Tawney, who's the chief academic officer for Great Hearts America, uh, has has offered his help, help both to explain to the board the performance of the schools but also to help uh, be a lifeline to the academic team uh, as we look to, to fill Will's position uh, over the next few weeks. So, uh, you know, Jake is no stranger to Texas. Uh, he, was, he was area superintendent here in South Texas for a period of time. So he's well known by the Texas organization and across Great Hearts. So Jake, thank you for coming. And uh, he'll take you through the numbers uh, and, and of course answer any questions. Jake, thank you. Thanks, Wade. And let me uh, also be the second to offer congratulations. Uh, very excited for you. Uh, this is, uh, let's see, it's 830. So in light of the late hour, I thought we'd open with a joke, we'd read a poem, I thought we'd all could prove the Pythagorean theorem together, and with any luck, we'll be out of here by midnight. You know? um, it's not often I have a chance to come address the Texas board, so I'm pretty excited to be here. Uh, these are, in fact, the, the slides of the hard work of Will Rutherford, and you know, in, in his absence, let me offer my thanks to him and his leadership over the academics of Texas for so many years. Uh, Will and myself and Will's team and my team have had a just a really stellar working relationship over the years. It's, I think it's probably one of the strongest partnerships that we see between Great Hearts America and really any of the, the departments within any of the regions uh, for all of our schools. So uh, my... my uh, Congratulations in absentia also goes out to, to Will Rutherford. Uh, these are these are his slides. Uh, it's his good work. Uh, he would, of course, have lots of details that, that, that I don't have right now. Uh, but I, what I thought we'd do before we talk through this is just to give the board a sense of sort of how we think about te state test scores. Uh, and I, I think it, it goes without saying there are two obvious statements, right? One is that they tell us something, and the other is that they don't tell us everything. Um, and maybe as a sub point to, they don't tell us everything. They, they don't often tell us the most important things, uh, even academically. And of course, the, the state scores don't tell us how we're doing in our formation and virtue, truth, goodness, and beauty, that, that thing that we never want to become a tagline. Um, but even academically, they don't tell us the most important things. We're going to look a lot at math and ELA tonight. In math, we prize problem solving. We prize proof. We prize convincing uh, others of the, the truth that you've found. And in ELA, we prize reading full novels, right? Reading full works of philosophy, reading uh, Charlotte's Web, right? And really being able to digest that. And of course, the, the state assessments of te test short co passage comprehension. So they don't Tell, tell us the most important things. Uh, but I want to return to that first point. They do tell us something. They are what we would call lagging indicators, right? The leading indicators are the instruction in the classroom. Part, a substantial part of what it means to offer a classical model uh, is that we care about the inputs as much as we care about the outputs because we believe that education is about formation. So when we, when we use Singapore math, which is a pillar of our math instruction in the elementary schools, we do so not just because of the outputs, not just because it's effective, but also because its very methodology teaches students that math is grounded in the real. When we use the seminar in Humane Letters, it's not just because, as you will see, it's highly effective in getting students to read with great proficiency and understanding and wisdom, but also because that methodology of the seminar teaches them how to have civic discourse. 
how to converse with one another about a work that's in front of them. But the state scores are lagging indicators. And so they do tell us something. In fact, it, it is common wisdom that a lot of times when, when we see problems in certain scores with certain groups, we'll often go into those classrooms and you can, you can see the inputs uh, are problematic as well. You can see that, that instruction is missing. Um, so let's just look at a few things here and then we'll take some questions. Did I already mess it up? There we go, just a lag. Um, you know, just a few highlights. Uh, what you see here is the pass rates by year. And I just want to point out, we'll focus just mostly on the blue, that as we move really from the post-COVID years in 2021 through 2024, I, I would call it relatively steady, right? Uh, up a few points, steady, down a few points. Uh, you know, we certainly would not have liked to seen it come down a few points. Uh, but for the most part, we're looking at kind of the low 80s. It just seems pretty steady. Um, what, what you don't see here, and I do think this is important to note as we look as an organization for where to improve, you don't see this necessarily broken down by the four achievement levels that students will get, right? You only see the pass rate. In the state of Texas, a student will pass if they achieve anyone except the bottom of these, right? But that is not how the state grade is determined. Now, of course, this year, as many of us know, we may not get state grades. Uh, they're kind of delayed because there's some lawsuits about this sort of thing. Um, but if and when they come, they will be calculated not just on a pass rate, but they will be calculated on the achievement levels that each of the students gets. They, they get more points for achieving at different levels. And as we dig into this data, we are seeing a trend that we don't like quite as much, where, where students do seem to be slipping a level, uh, but it's not showing up in the pass rate because they're not slipping to that bottom level. Uh, it's, just, it's not much, uh, but it is a direction that we'd like to reverse, and you're going to see some of the steps that we want to take um, or that we plan to take late, later tonight. Um, the other way, though, of digging into this uh, is to look at grade level and subjects. And I think the story here was well, there's a couple stories, right? Uh, one is, as we look at reading, uh, my heart leaps just a little bit. Um, because, A, we just seem to be knocking it out of the park on this assessment. Now, again, the assessment is about short passage comprehension. That's a basic skill that we want students to do well on. It's not the most important thing. But if you look at the trend, the obvious story here is that the longer students are with us, the better they do. That as we move them from grade three up through grade 10, the reading scores just continue to climb. Now, even as a math guy who's fundamentally passionate about mathematics, uh, I've often been found to say that our reading list is our mission. So to see the ELA scores climb like that, to be able to make the claim that the, the more students stay with us, the better off they are, uh, is, is a pretty profound thing and makes me very proud to be a parent of a great art student. We see that same trend in science and history. Now, history is a little bit more limited. You, you really only get this in eighth and ninth grade. Um, but we see the trend in science moving from five through eight and into biology. Now, does the 56% in grade five bother me? Yeah, it bothers me a little bit. It doesn't bother me that much though, right? In large part, because in the elementary school, we are doing core knowledge science, which does process through a very deliberate methodology, getting kids to really know and understand facts about science, and then to appreciate the whole methodology of science, starting with observation. We'd like to do better than 56%, but I do want to point out to the board that as we move from five through eight and into biology, the scores just start climbing. So if you, you think about the Greyhards graduate, if you think about what it is that we're trying to do as a K-12 program of formation, um, it does seem to be working in science. Math, on the other hand, is a little bit more sporadic, and you can see that from the graph. Now, I, I wish we had actually left, in some sense, the grade eight thing off, but just because of the asterisk that's there. So I do need the board to understand most of our students are taking algebra one. So there is a, a, a footnote there that says, look, it's really less than 8% that are taking the eighth grade math test in eighth grade. Almost all of our students are in algebra. And the students doing eighth grade math in eighth grade are often transfer students who just didn't have the background. So we're working with them and supporting them and, and, and moving them through the program in that way. Um, and so, of course, we'd like that to be higher, but that's a very, very small percentage of our students. Um, you know, I will note that I am proud of the, the eighth grade, or sorry, the, the eighth grade algebra test, the 86%. I, you know, wish we can get that just a little bit higher into the ELA range. Um, but if you think about algebra as the pinnacle of middle school math, it's the end. It's the thing, thing that we're trying to do really from K through eighth. Right, And then, then in ninth grade, we start with very mature mathematics through geometry moving into calculus. But there is sort of this intermediate end that happens in algebra. And we seem to do very, very well. So, you know, again, as students stay with us, 
they start to perform well. The thing that's a little bit more interesting is the elementary school in grades three through five. Uh, it dips in grade four. This is true historically. This is something we want to dig into. We don't quite know why this is true. We, we think that there might be a sequencing problem with when certain topics are tested and whether or not we get to those before the test, but it's something that, that our team is going to want to look into. Um, you know, again, historically, this is just what seems to happen. Then it bounces right back up in the in, in grade five. We see middle school come down a little bit. This is true in Texas. It seems to be true not just across the Great Hearts Network, but also true across the nation. Uh, state averages start to slip in, in middle school. Um, we would like to see them do a good bit better. Uh, we do have a new curriculum in place called Carnegie Math, and wherein our team is working closely with the headmasters to support this, uh, we are seeing those scores do a, a turnaround. So we think we have at least the first part of a success formula right. We have a strong curriculum. Uh, the next thing to work on is just consistent, strong instruction in that curriculum, uh, and then, and then of course, into intervention programs. Okay. So that's the data. Uh, what's the plan? There we go. Uh, I'll go quickly through this because we really want to spend most of our time on the last bullet point. Um, but obviously, some of this just becomes common sense. The plan is, of course, an aligned professional development strategy. And here I mean we, we do want to focus on fourth grade. So let's look at that content. Let's look at the pacing. Uh, let's, let's look at how teachers are progressing through the lesson plans that are available to them in the portal. Um, are, are they making their way through it? Uh, so giving that directed PD in there and then continuing some of the professional development in the science course in elementary school. And then I would also say we're, we're doing a lot of this already, but a continued commitment to the middle school math PD. Um, a, a data literacy strategy in Texas, we are very, very lucky to have Michael Linville, who largely is, just gets wonderful reviews from all of the schools in working with the schools on trying to understand the data that we have in our map testing. And then, of course, in the prior year star testing. And Michael is one of those just uh, my colleague Heather Washburn will say one of those unicorns that really understands what to do with data in a way that doesn't make us subservient to it. He will lead off his presentations with all of the teachers and the headmasters with a very a call to just humane education and we are here to help students that the whole goal is to help students so where in the data can help us do that we will pay attention to it um, that this is something that that will rutherford and curtis indorf before him did very well in texas and so we'll we'll keep on that um, you'll hear a little bit more in future board meetings about some of the special education emphasis that we have. I, I don't want to step, of course, on Monet's toes, uh, but that, that of course, becomes part of an academic plan, right? As we know, the, the special education students are often the ones that are struggling a little bit more, um, and so a, an attention to that is part of the plan as well. Um, but finally, the thing that is brand new to Texas this year, and, and we really kicked it off this summer, is a process of identifying targeted support for certain schools. And leading that effort is uh, Mrs. Heather Washburn, who's uh, our Vice President for Student Achievement and, and Accountability. And uh, I, think, I think I can say this publicly, uh, certainly the best hire that I made on the team. Um, she has, over the, a very short amount of time, been able to craft a process of identifying schools and then working with them, again, in this very humane way of, of what, what we like to say is just leading the headmaster to do the work of being a headmaster, to do the work of being an instructional lead. And it's not seen by anybody as this imposition coming from the outside. It's a collaborative effort that starts with school leadership to throw resources at them to help them improve. Um, and we were able to kick this off in some schools last year around the country. And this year, starting this summer, like I said, we've been able to, to, to partner in a very strong way with, with Will's group uh, and uh, and with the Texas schools. So I'd like to just cede maybe just five minutes of my time to Heather to just talk through what that process looks like and then we can take questions from the board. Uh, good evening. The process that we developed is something that we've seen as a need across the network, and that's a collaborative process with schools to improve performance. In the past, it has been left to the headmaster to really carry the weight of that performance on their shoulders and work with their team to identify what they need to do to improve. And in this process, what we are doing is we are inviting them to join us in identifying the areas for improvement 
and saying, okay, is it a curricular alignment question? And we can bring in our curricular team to really work with them to identify that. Is it something that we need to develop in our teachers? We can work with our professional development team to identify those areas. So schools are identified for uh, the academic improvement process through looking at student progress, what we would call growth, and then student achievement or proficiency. And so the students that uh, we look at growth, the percentage of students are growing year over year at a campus, and then the percentage of students meeting grade level proficiency at a campus. And we identify then those schools based on those metrics for improvement. Uh, the process starts, it's a full year process, where at the end of that year, we will look at their goals and that criteria to see if they will progress out of improvement or if they will stay in improvement for another year. Uh, the core team that works with the schools is the Texas uh, Director of Academics and then the Vice President, me, uh, working with them, uh, giving that partnership and collaborative approach uh, to the schools. And so we make up the core team then with the headmaster. There are two initial meetings that we set right right away. Uh, first is what we will what I'd call an audit. Uh, we meet with the headmaster, we pull in all sorts of data. So we might, we'll have performance data, benchmark data, intervention data. We'll look at those leading indicators that Jake mentioned. We'll look to see if they have an instructional coaching plan. We'll look to see if they have an intervention program. If those are absent, then we start to identify priorities based on that audit uh, that allows the school to really wrestle with what do we need to start to build and what support do we need? In that process, then the core team identifies three to five priorities that will be the key levers to improve uh, the uh, growth of students and their proficiency or their achievement. Uh, once those priorities are set, as Jake mentioned, we invite the headmaster to be the leader of the project with their team. So the headmaster then looks at those priorities they define the SMART goals that they will achieve, and they identify the key actions that they will take at the campus level uh, to achieve that improvement. Once that's done, we give them about two weeks to build that out with their, their academic leadership team. And we come back in as the core team, and we meet with the entire leadership team at the campus. We review the plan, we make edits, revisions, and then we finalize the plan. At that point, that's when we start to identify what support they need. Uh, we have schools that ask for uh, certain coaches to come out to the campus to work with their math teachers and to then also develop the campus coaches. Uh, we also then have uh, members of uh, the Texas team who are very focused on intervention, who will come in and help them build out what we call their lyceum plan. They're part of the day where they have intervention built in, and that person comes in and really helps them identify curriculum and to build out the plan for intervention. Uh, that the support comes at that point in time in the process. Uh, we then act as the coordinators for this process. So the school doesn't have to carry all that coordination. So the Texas director and I will coordinate the support for the academy and make sure that they have the touch points they need for the support they need when they need it. One headmaster said to me, my teacher, my I guess the department lead for math, she just needs to who to go to so that she can ask the questions to get the support. And we can coordinate that and we work with the schools for that process. Uh, after the plan is created, we initiate it. And then uh, the core team meets every month. Uh, we have a, a Teams meeting where we will jump on uh, our computers and we will engage in conversation how are things going? We'll problem solve with the head of school and we'll really work through that process. We then have quarterly site visits where we look at the plan. We then go observe classes. We observe intervention, whatever the priorities are. We're then there to have an observation process. We'll look at artifacts. And once again, we'll problem solve with the school leader to say, what do we need to work on in the process? Uh, we will also look at data at that point. Uh, Michael Linville will be a key partner in that as we look at the data so we can identify any target areas that we need to tweak in the process. Uh, and that's the progress monitoring part of this. 
Uh, the goal, I want to highlight the goal. The goal is to ensure that students are growing academically, that they're gaining the skills they need to become lifelong learners. And as Jake mentioned, those lagging indicators of performance, they tell a story at times, and they allow us to identify the skills that a child might need, identify areas that we need to improve to ensure we're educating all students at the level we want to, so that they can grow in the skills they need to become lifelong learners in that pursuit of truth, goodness, and beauty. Improvement is not just for the end of improvement, it's for the end of making sure that we are providing them the education we've committed to our families to offer them. So that's the improvement process. Uh, we have schools that are very invested and committed and we're excited to work with them. Uh, questions from the board on the academic update. Uh, this is Jonathan Sanford. Thanks, thanks very much, and and thank you, Mr. Towney, for stepping into this role in the midst of of your other duties. And um, I found this very helpful. My 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 question, thinking about the expansion schools and the rate of expansion, if you were to control for expansion, would we see the uh, dip that we saw in the overall scores? Um, and uh, I'm just wondering in terms of, of the aggregate numbers, um, yeah. what, 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 uh, what, what yeah. would be. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Sanford. Uh, it's a great question. There's, there's two ways to answer that. One way is in the aggregate and that actually is displayed a little bit in the slide. It doesn't just pull out growth. It pulls out growth and online. You still see the dip a little bit. It's still, the dip gets reduced, but not much because, uh, the the number of the, the amount of expansion was just not enough to carry that down. So it's still there. Now, what I'd really like to dig into, and I don't have this data, is a second way to answer that, which is if we actually started to pull out particular kids, you know, rather than just the expansion schools, because what you see in the in that slide, uh, when I say aggregate, it's really it is really pulling the schools out. I'd like to actually just pull the the expansions out by kid, uh, and to see if that tells a different story. And I don't have that right now. Thanks. Yep. Thank you again for your uh, presentation. I wanted to know how many schools in Texas that you guys are working with, or is every yeah. headmaster have access to you and your team? Um, yeah. And so apologies for answering that also in two ways. Uh, so I think I have this right. For school improvement, it's three in North Texas and three in San Antonio. Right. So there are six schools directly working with Heather's team through the school improvement process, but we continue to work with all of the schools in different ways. Right. So so the America team, my team will be in schools doing lots of different supports, you know, not and that ranges anything from the school improvement process to particular curricular training. You know, we have a director of lower school curriculum and upper school curriculum that will get invited in, come in, do classroom observations and particular training through that, but also new grades uh, set up. So any school that's adding a new grade level. Level, gets a dedicated set of meetings with my team uh, to ensure that they know, you know, what is the curriculum? What are you ordering? How do you get ready for it? What is the training that you need? Uh, and then I would be remiss if I didn't say that there is another side to the academic shop at, uh, at Gray Hearts America, and that is the professional development team. Uh, and that's guided by Corinne Jacobson, who's our vice president of, of um, professional development. And she's under Gerilyn Olson, our chief people officer. Uh, and they that PD team also interacts quite a bit with all the headmasters, at the very least through new faculty orientation, but also through uh, you know training and instructional coaching throughout the year. Heather's process becomes interesting for those six schools because I think she describes this, that it, it kind of starts to bring all these teams together um, for the schools that need a little bit more particular attention throughout the year. But there's not a single school in Texas we will not be in, in one form or another throughout the year. Thank you. Other questions? Comments? Thank you. Thanks. Appreciate it. Mr. Chairman, that's that's our report. Uh, I just want to emphasize just how strong these schools are in Texas and how grateful we are for Jake and team's help, especially in Will's absence. And uh, we'll be we'll be back, of course, in in with filling Will's Will's role, but in the meantime, and then and ongoing through the year, uh, these supports for the schools I think are very important. Uh, I've I've seen it in action elsewhere, and I know that 
it can it can be useful to the headmasters. Okay, thank you, Dr. Dyke. Uh, with that, we'll turn to the finance update, uh, Mr. Byrne. Can y'all hear me all right? So I did want to uh, congratulate Dr. Dyke. Uh, Dr. Dyke is not new to Texas. He's been our finance committee chair for a couple of years, so I've worked alongside him. Uh, I know some folks have asked, what does it mean to have Mr. Dyke or Dr. Dyke here? And so the meaning of a dike is a thick wall that is built to stop water flooding into a very low-lying land from a river or from the sea. So we know there's a lot going on here in Texas. So uh, I think you're, 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 you're the guy. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to start really with uh, really where we, uh, just for an agenda, I'll try to run through these slides quick because I know it's getting late here. Uh, our fiscal year 24 enrollment, ADA, financials, audit, charter first ratings, and then where we stand for fiscal year 25. Uh, enrollment in terms I think I just messed it up so in terms of last year's enrollment uh, we had budgeted about 12,100 students and we ended the year this is a snapshot of uh, June so we ended about four percent off so keep in mind midway through the year average is about two percent so so really that's what we get paid on it, it, it's the uh, that average enrollment and then there's of course there's uh You've heard me talk about this a lot, ADA, so we ended at 95%. So if you combine those two together, we really are getting paid at about 93% of our 11th day enrollment. Uh, turning to the next slide here, where did we end the year? Now, we haven't finalized these numbers. We're getting ready uh, for audit here. Uh, a slight loss, pretty much where I thought we'd be break even. Uh, we probably will pick up a little bit. The state does a true up in September, so we'll pick up. Uh, that could be anywhere from you know five hundred thousand to you know eight hundred thousand. So we'd probably pick up a little bit more there. In terms of our debt service coverage, we track that a lot. Uh, we are right at about one point two. So that's uh, for our charter first ratings. That's important to maintain the one point two for bond purposes. We could go as low as a one point one, but. If we go below that, we lose points on that rating system. In terms of our cash, we're looking uh, at a balance sheet. We're looking very strong, probably getting closer to the 60-day mark at year end. And uh, we had promised Moody's that we would get very close to 60 days and uh, with the goal of getting to 70 days by next year. And again, chart of first ratings, if you're below 60, you lose points there. So I just wanted to draw your attention to that as well. Uh, Chartist first ratings, every year the state <clears throat> rates us on, uh, as, you know, there's academic performance, but then there's our, our financial performance, and they issue a report card that's in the back of your packet, the full report. Uh, these are the areas, and you can see where I joined in 22, and we were at a C, and the reason we were at a C was because we had some uh, material weaknesses and procurement. So you automatically, if you have a material weakness, they put you into a C. We brought that up to an A. And this is uh, one year in arrears. So the rating for this year is based on the 23 audited financials. So we've achieved a B, a high B, an 86. But where we lost points, I just wanted to point out with the uh, drop in the cash and also the state funding, we've a number of days of cash on hand went down last year and so that's back up to 60 so i think we'll pick up points in the next next round and then uh they also the other area was current liabilities and that's somewhat related to the cash and the receivable from the state those are your current assets divided by your liabilities so last year we were eight out of ten now we're four there so we lost points there and then the last area was really in the uh, percentage of administration over uh the instructional costs and ours has gotten up to about 20%. So last year we were graded a six there and this year a four. So we've lost, those are the areas that we've lost points. So if we want to get back up to an A, those are the areas as well as the debt service coverage. We need to keep that up as well. Uh, wanted to give you an update on an audit. Uh, the auditors are walking in the door in about a week from now. They've asked us for 
a ton of information and that's actually what they look like when they come in they they really glare at you and they they it's like their job to find something but uh anyhow they'll be coming in they'll be spending uh three full weeks when i say coming in they'll do work remote too but they'll probably spend part of the time in the office and the goal here is to complete or substantially complete the audit by the time we get to the next finance committee meeting and have a final report to the board on november 7th we know that that is due to the TA at the end of November, so we want to make sure that that is uh, timely done. And then uh, on the next couple of slides, just wanted to talk about enrollment again and what I was talking about before. Uh, attrition is it's very important, and I want to commend the operations team. They did a phenomenal job this year in putting together a, a plan for enrollment. And so the goal here, what we've done differently this year, in prior years we budgeted a number and then we've just all year long tried to hit that target. We actually budgeted to a mid-year budget and the goal was to start the year at 102% because you're gonna have attrition, an average attrition of about 2%. So that's the way we budgeted this year. And then in terms of our 11 day, I just wanted to run through a couple of things here. We told the TA we would be at about 13,128 and our 11 day is at 13,060. So we're 99 and a half percent to where we told the TA, which is great. In terms of uh, last year in uh, June to where we are now, we're up about 12% in enrollment. So that's, that's significant. And then uh, from a budgetary standpoint of view, we had done an ADA adjusted. So when I say ADA adjusted, that's the attrition plus the uh, ADA. You know, we plan for about 11,500 or 499 rather. And so we're at about 95% of that. So there is a little bit of uh, pickup that we need to do. We need to send out some more offers. And we also have to work on managing enrollment, attrition. And ADA is the other area. We've talked about that before. So uh, there's a lot of work being done behind the scenes to, to manage that. And then for online, they are down a, a bit, but online is... Uh, Theirs is based on course completion, and last year they achieved 94% on course completion, so they can actually manage their expenses a lot easier. They have a lot less fixed costs, So, uh, but there is some ground to make up there. But I, I do want to say we're off to a very strong start with enrollment this year. And then I think that was it for my slides, so I'll just, if there are any questions, I'll take those now from the board members. Thank, uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Byrne. I'll turn. Go ahead. Uh, John, Jonathan Sanford, uh, thanks, Mr. Byrne, for the presentation. Just one question, thinking about the FY25 um, rating, the 20% the threshold for uh, administrative costs, um, um, I'm wondering where we are right now. Um, I know we, we made some adjustments, reduced the size of the administrative staff and, and increase some instructional costs so uh yeah there's there's, there's two things there uh, on the texas side we this year and, and again this rating is going to be on the audited financials for fiscal year 24 we did pull out about a million dollars from the budget on the texas side we're also actively working this also includes the work that america is doing on their sort so we are actually working together to try to manage those costs and it was part of what we talked about earlier in the earlier session Does that answer the question or? Yeah, I mean, really on both sides of the fence, we're looking to control those administration. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 thank you. I was just wondering if we're gonna pick up points on that particular item, if it, uh, if it, if it looks like know, we're I'm, below the 20% threshold. Well, I, I'm, we're gonna to have to, you know, I, I can't tell you right now until we have the final audit, but I, I can come back to you at the next board meeting and give you an update on that. But, uh, you know, 24 is sort of done, right? We have to right. be proactively working on bringing those costs down. Yeah, great. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Byrne or, or Dr. Dyke, I'm wondering if you could comment as you look out in terms of uh, our expenditures, how, a lot of it's people and you've got facilities and then the overhead. How, how, do, you, how do you think we want to shake out over the long term in terms of a sustainable model? Do you, do you want to take that? You take first, Greg? Yeah, I will. I mean, one of the things that we've talked about, you know, 70% of our budget is personnel, right? So we have to manage, you know, knowing that there's still a little bit of makeup on the enrollment, we really need to manage that. So we're prioritizing 
I would say safety, special education, as far as staffing. So we, you know, as we get requests for more staffing, I would say, you, know, you can't judge by July's come in, but there's no school in session in July. So July looks good, I can tell you that. But I don't, you know, when when, we, when school starts and we see August, that's when we really know. So Wade, did you have any follow comments there? I would just, just reiterate that the, 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 as the August numbers come in, we'll have a much better picture. We are seeing a lot of requests for special education staffing. We're obviously trying to support the schools with those requests. Uh, as we look as we look ahead, you know, the, the organization made sacrifices this year so that we could make a teacher salary increase, and and we're very hopeful as we look ahead to the to the legislative environment in in the spring that that they'll improve charter school funding such that we're able to improve the picture for next fiscal year. So I would say, in that sense, I'm optimistic. I think as Kevin mentioned, this year we, we're going to have to we're going to have to really watch how the expenses are coming in. And continue to to manage positively enrollment and attendance in order to to have a successful year. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Because I have a uh, I have a question about the ADA number. Uh, just piggybacking on what um, Dr. Dyke just said. Do we have any idea of how our ADA number compares to other charters or even public schools? non-charter public schools for that matter? I, I don't have an answer for you right now. There's, I don't know if anybody else, Lisa, do you, do you have a sense of that compared to? Okay, so we're actually better is what you're saying, yeah. Higher than, is that what you're saying? And I, I would say prior to COVID, we we're probably 96 and a half, something like that. So we've still not come back from COVID. I don't know if people have just gotten into the mindset of, you know, not coming in person, but, you know, there's, there is work to be done there. Thank you. I just wanted to make a comment uh, that came out of our finance committee, sure. kind of like to help frame like what um, the change in percentage of ADA, what that actually means in relation to the budget. And so uh, it was a kind of an estimate but like a 1% change in the ADA is about a million dollars. Yeah. I mean, if you 12,000 kids, we get 10,000 yes. per student. You can just do the math. It's 1.2 million. And based on so. enrollment. So enrollment to about a hundred kids is also about a million dollars. So that just kind of helps you to frame like how, how you're looking at the budgets and it, it's always nice with round numbers, but anyway, I just, no, that no, came out of finance true. committee. Kevin Hall actually said that. And I thought that was really helpful to me uh, to kind of, you know, think about how these small little shifts, if, you know, you don't, the kids don't come to school on a particular right. day exactly. or a holiday weekend, you know, those do impact our, our, our bottom line. And we're trying to making sure that we're, um, you know, having the right services, we're providing uh, all scholars with the right services, providing teachers with increased salaries, et cetera. So it all matters. So anyway, it does. It does. Yeah. Good, good point. Any other questions or comments for Mr. Byrne? For being done. Thank you. Well, thank you. And that's like 9.03, so we're good, good, good place. Du duly noted. <laughs> Why do I have a feeling that you may be bankrolling some time for a, a, a future? Uh... Okay, uh, we've reached the end of our agenda, and so I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. So move. John, move. move. It's been moved and seconded uh, to adjourn. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Meeting is adjourned at 9.03 p.m. Thank you.